Hello, our friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. Hello there. Welcome back, everybody. Hope everybody is having an awesome day. Indeed, we do. Make sure you subscribe to both channels, and hopefully you get some notifications, both Evolutionary Energy Arts and EE Arts. So we want to go deeper into some of the mysteries and just share you a little bit more of why we look so closely at everything that comes from the Indus Valley Civilization, the Vedic worldview, Sanskrit in itself is known as the mother language of so many modern day language. Uh, in the Indo-European Indo languages, the Indo part is referring to Sanskrit. And it is an ancient language, and it's actually said to be not only spoken here, but also in the higher planets of the demigods. Isn't that fascinating? It's called the language of God and the demigods. And it, there's such clear knowledge in not only the Vedas, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, the Puranas, all these other holy quote-unquote texts of just the fact that we are not alone, that there's many different forms of life, all sorts of humanoid forms of life out there. In fact, life is abundant. And there are many different civilizations and cultures and the fact that there have been wars on this planet between different ent entities that are not indigenous to this planet. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, this information is interesting too. I remember when I was going through my, my awakening and I would read in the Bible and there was this something inside of me that just was saying, this just doesn't make sense. But I wanted to keep trying because I wanted to believe in something bigger than myself. I wanted something magical in my life. And no matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't believe it. But when you get into these other ancient scripts, you can feel the truth in it. You can feel that these are not things that are just made up. There are all kinds of entities out there. There's many different types of wars that they speak of. There's different types of beings. There's different types of technology. It's it's all out there and it's all, you know, if we can take the time to sit and read it and it is quite complicated, uh, we can learn a whole lot about ourselves and then other other entities, even treaties as well. Absolutely. And so when we look at this, and this is representing again, our sun's travel through our galaxy and how as it goes through different zones, it keeps going through these different time periods in which we are in a different vibration of a different vibratory frequency and rate and so we encounter different beings when we are in the Kali Yuga the thick of the Kali Yuga we are third density now or 3d right 3d this is 3d why did the gods all disappear out in the open why did they all just disappear as we fell into the Kali Yuga that certainly the benevolent ones disappeared and the ones that seemed to be, treat humanity as slaves and nothing more that had an opportunistic mindset uh, they stuck around for a bit and then they were kind of gone too gone from the open sure UFO sightings alien abductions they always happen but as far as openly being out there with us when we head out here into the Dwapara when we're in, if we want to view this as we could view it as a Bronze Age, an Iron Age, a Bronze Age, again, heading in the direction towards the light, then we start to see, we cross over a certain boundary and all of a sudden we're in fourth density and we're in the lower fourth density and then there's all these beings that appear to us. And as we go on, and this is going to be a, a kind of a chaotic time in this period because you have opportunistic beings that will be able to interact with us all the time on a regular basis right in front of you anytime they so choose. Right now, beings from the lower fourth density can, can interact with us um, in our dream time and also they can, some of them can, can, can have a physical type 
of influence on us, but in a, a manner where they're manipulating our psyches and kind of overriding people and personalities. Mm -hmm. You know, and that uh, brings me to something, a good example of a video we just did a few days ago, and it showed a picture of an entity. And I did say that what I was seeing and feeling, it looked like this entity was protecting. But when I when I said that, I didn't mean that it was protecting out of a positive nature. A lot of times these entities will stick on people and that becomes their source of food. So in that sense, Hello there. Well they want that entity to be um, of good mind and good value so that they can leach that information or that energy off of them. And this does happen quite a lot. And this is why you want to keep yourself cleansed. This is why you want to do a lot of things, salt bath, sage, to keep these entities off of you because it does make it very uncomfortable for them to stick to you and use you as a food source. And they do. So meaning of protection, yes, in that sense, it's protect protecting its food source well again you know let's say a mountain lion made it kill right and is is about to feed on its kill and this entity could be feeding on the person all day long day after day week after week month after month year after year and they absolutely do um and then a bear comes along and bear is really hungry and the bear sees it and says i want that for myself I'm going in for the kill. And then there's a little bit of a conflict and one of them will win. Mm -hmm. Neither the bear nor the mountain lion, let's say it was a deer, you know, that was captured, uh, looks at the deer in a loving way. Right. It, I mean, it's just <laughs> thankful. Thank you for the food, you know. That's really how it's looking at it. And you're not having my food. And this is what the entities, how the entities um basically treat us and again it all depends on where we are in the cycle of the yugas so as we go here and we're heading more into the middle uh fourth density it, it gets to be less like a hell less like you know demonic entities more kind of more mundane i would say more more of a, a middle frequency and then when we go up here, we're starting to head into what many take to be the heavenly realms. Um, as as we're, we're going out and we're heading towards that silver age, you know, in comparison to the Kali Yuga, it's wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful. And ultimately, when we get to the Satya and the Golden Age, we're talking about a 5D existence where beings understand. Uh, ultimately, everything is one. We need to work together. We're all parts of a greater whole. You know, this is how things transition out. And then we head back down through the descending cycle again, heading towards this uh, dark age yet again. So, you know, it's something that recurs and it's actually more of a, a spiral. We could think of it. It's very much like DNA. You know, again, there's that reflection as above, so below. So there's different entities associated and different entities encountered as we go through the the cycle of the yugas. The, there was a lot of buzz a little while back about these flying cities in China and in other places too, where people saw what looked to be cities in the clouds. Now, there's a lot of different possible expo explanations. Of course, you know, science will always say it's some sort of weather phenomena. Oh, yeah, okay, those square-looking, uh, yeah, building structures. That's that's a uh, a superfluous cloud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. superfluous cloud. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, oh, well, we know those. We've always had those. Yeah, <laughs> we we just make a new label up. Yeah, again, when we're as we're going through these cycles and we're starting to head into a zone where we are literally tiptoeing out of 3D, tiptoeing into 4D, there's going to be such a small difference between these different densities that some things will start to appear to be actually physical and at some point in time they will be physical there there are many other planets out there that we don't know about about officially that are just sitting there in 4d waiting for us to see them as soon as we get up to that same vibratory frequency and you know one of them is actually inhabited by the ant people that the Hopi speak of that helped humanity go into the earth 
in order to survive uh, a gigantic cataclysm, the one that we would associate with the Younger Dryas event and the biblical flood stories. There's actually over 450 flood stories from different people, different tribes all over the globe. Very, very much like Noah. And again, Noah, well, there's a Sumerian version of the Noah story, which is thousands of years older than the biblical. So a lot of people are discovering all these things right now. And, and that's what we're calling the, the awakening. So they might, um, a lot of people might refer to this a, as a cloud, but you can see it's a little bit different. And when you look at this information, you realize through the densities, there really is no veil. I mean, this has always been here. These, these vehicles or whatever you want to call them, beings, entities, floating cities, I find them to be very, very real. And when I look at them, I feel something when I see them. I don't think they're an angular cloud. They can call them what they will. That's fine. If many people want to believe that's what it is, that's fine. But what I'm pointing out is there really is no veil. These things are always here. Maybe just slight out of slightly out of a out of our density, but they are. Um, we can definitely perceive them in different ways as we hone our energetic abilities. As we hone our skills in reading energy, it, everything is always right there for us. Yeah, it absolutely is. And then there's also the line of thinking where these things in many cases can be what we would call motherships. You know, they're actually very, very large ships. Take your home with you while you travel. Right. How about that? You see a floating city appears in sky over China. Just the Photoshop, nothing to see here. You know, this was from 2015. It, it's fascinating uh, to, to see these things and think, is there really anything to it? But when we go again back into all the different Hindus' holy books, these stories speak consistently constantly about beings flying in the sky and various types of beings air india 3000 bc yeah 5000 years ago people zooming around all the time up in the sky between the time of the um, mahabharata and the ramayana which again you know these, these nobody is in total agreement on when these stories come from uh, and in fact, in the West, it's, it's, there's this great desire to date these things as being much newer than they are. But we could tell from different astrological points of view uh, when they talk about certain star positions and also talk about certain events and cities that are underwater now that weren't underwater uh, in the past. And speaking of these cities uh, that are, you know, still above <laughs> above the water above the waves and in remembrance of when they go went down below the waves all these things point to these being much much older uh than they than the official archaeologists want to let people know of because again there's this big big push to make everything that comes out of um, the sumerian tradition to be the oldest but it's not the oldest and in fact, there's very, very different ways of living that we've discovered that were in effect in uh, India, Pakistan, and other areas over there where we've discovered cities that didn't even have walls. They had no armies, no weapons, no weapon storerooms. They were living in a complete sense of peace. And there was also no organized temples no place of religious worship whoa that's bizarre uh, isn't it compared to what we see everywhere else in some cases well it was a different society they they recognized different truths and one of the facts was just that there are many different types of beings that interact in this planet and not all of them are humans and many of them do fly using technologies, different technologies. It's fascinating, too, that we were talking about the different yugas and that 
descriptions of the vimanas, and again, you could look at vimana as as basically meaning a craft, a vehicle. They're of different types of construction in different time periods, and and I think that is again something that's fascinating. When we see the, the Kali Yuga, vimanas are made mechanically. They're machinery. When you get to the Satya Yuga, they're literally made of light. They're they're different. They're pure energy. They're they're a life force, prana. Very, very different. And then there's a transition here with Dwapara and Treta between the two. So here you have things that are completely mechanical. And as we go higher up, the technology is higher. The beings themselves are higher. So what we have in the Kali Yuga is very different than the Satya Yuga. And again, there are beings and wars ongoing between these beings that we call the Devas, who are benevolent beings that teach that Source is within you. It's within you. You don't really need anything besides what already is inside of you. You know, there is no quote unquote salvation to be attained. Uh, from anybody else or anybody else doing anything. It's all about you. It's all about your own realization, your own self-realization. And what we see in the Kali Yuga and and also when we get to this portion of the Dwapara where these other self-serving beings come in, they come in demanding worship. So this is all about, you know, you you shall have no other alien gods but us. Or, or me even, the individual deity that presided over a particular city-state. So very interesting, very different craft, very different beings, depending on where we are. Mm -hmm. And different, different uh, ways to make electricity. It talks about all the different ways to harness the sun's rays, and it gives you these calculations it gives you these exact uh, notions of how to harness this certain electricity from this sun ray. So I thought that was really interesting about the different ways. And, and I feel strongly it's because they're just in different parts of the, an, an etheric world that we might not understand here. So all of these writings are there. It's just, well, we should be taught this stuff from kindergarten, I think. I wish we were. That would be a lot of fun because I'm just getting into it now in the last few years and it's really very, very fascinating. It's just a very difficult read. Um, but you can feel the truth in it. And there's a lot of um, talk of electricity and a lot of talk of technology that's just the sun. The sun is utilized. You know, our natural life force is u utilized and, and there's no pollution. Absolutely. These are the higher uh, energies. And again, the beings are very different. So again, I'm sorry just to go... Um, back to the different yugas. So the devas, we, we could put up in this, this realm and above. And then we could put these other beings that we call the asuras. And so the asuras are, are more demonic. Demonic in the sense really that they are all about their, their service to self. So the difference between a golden age, when the devas are teaching us directly, teaching us directly, and there are legends of the ancient sh and shining ones, the beings that just shine and glitter like a golden sun, not necessarily even taking a full form in front of us, in front of us, but us being able to perceive them as light beings when we ourselves are light beings, but they are still of a, a little bit more uh, refined nature, some of the higher devas. And then, of course, we have all these legends of the demigods and of these semi divine semi-human beings it all relates to the cycle of the yugas again and so the asuras are are the beings that literally they come they conquer and they set themselves up as the kings the queens and the god to be worshipped this is uh, what we have in these different time periods so there's many different types of vimanas. There's many different drawings and diagrams of these different vimanas, which are all uh, vehicles, vessels, ships. Interesting too, uh, some that it's noted that will fly from the sky, land on the earth, or even submerge and go under the ocean only to reemerge from the ocean 
land on the earth or go back out into the heavens. And they do also have, you remember the legend of Enoch? Enoch you know, was taken by God because God found pleasure in him. And then, of course, we have, you know, the book of Enoch and stuff taken up to the heavens. Well, it's the same thing with, with these stories. There's stories of, of humans that are taken up to the heavens and they see thousands and thousands of vimanas. They see vimanas, so many vimanas that it's, it's mind-blowing. You can't count all the vimanas that are up there in the heavens. They see how there are other humanoid and different types of what we would call divine beings, so to speak, where they would look at them as divine beings going about their business up in the heavens and on different worlds as well. So it's very clear that what we are talking about is extraterrestrial and interdimensional beings mingling with humans out in the open. Mm -hmm. These days we might call it abduction, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly, except for it's with different purposes depending on who the beings are. So again, there's all these different diagrams of these different uh, vimanas and, you know, so many ancient drawings of them depicting them up in the sky. Oh, don't worry. That's one of the good guys. It's not It's not an Asura. Oh, okay, good. And whereas if you saw the vehicle of the Asura, you might be like, run for the hills, quick, and get into the woods, get into the caves. And when we look to Turkey and in uh, Cappadocia uh, and some of these massive underground cave networks that could house tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, that were barricaded from the inside in such a manner that they were terrified about something coming in. What were they hiding from? Who were they hiding from? You know, you got to ask, those are fair questions. And it's like, how did, how did these caves get there? Who built them? Because it doesn't seem we really have the technology or, you know, we would have at least noticed it. So a lot of the history that they've been telling us all along just simply is not true it, it's just a story that they tell us to keep us you know in in control or under their control and that's what irritates me i i know there's so much more out there than what we are given and i think we're coming up on a time where we're just going to start to realize for ourselves more and more of the truth as people demand it as the times change and and light bulbs turn on it, it's really a very exciting time to be alive because we know we're evolving all at once Absolutely. And some of these, you know, flying cities, so to speak, motherships, you know, they could actually land on the ground and, you know, be as large as some of our largest cities today. And here we see Gurkha flying in his swift and powerful Vimana hurled against the three cities of the Vrishis and the Anhakas, a single projectile charged with all the power of the universe an incandescent column of smoke and fire as brilliant as 10,000 suns rose in all its splendor. That's from the Mahabharata. Clearly, we're talking about beings that have amazing technology flying in the sky, utilizing technology that the only way we could conceive of it really is uh, conceiving of it in terms of nuclear weaponry. And yet there are certain battles in which it's, it's stated that in one single battle, over a billion people died in one battle. Something is very, very distorted in our history. When we look to, again, these stories here, they're very clear. There, there's kind of no way of interpreting it any other way. And there's evidence all over from different cultures of, of representations of these flying ships again. And there's many different buildings that have been constructed in remembrance of these flying vehicles that came down, landed, and housed these beings. These beings that were worshipped as gods. Now, you know, not the creator of this universe, but beings worshipped for their technology. And depending on the age, either out of fear, when we're talking Kali Yuga into the Bronze Age, fear of, of them doing nasty things to humans, or out of joy and gratitude when we're talking the golden age 
for teaching us all the secrets and mysteries and how to better ourselves. You can see representations all over the globe, every different society, they're all showing the same sort of representations here. This is something that it was not, um, it was not a, a, an occurrence that happened once in the blue moon. There, there were regular interminglings between non-human beings and human beings. Many of them looked very, very similar to us, some not so similar. It's all basically out there. Strong and durable must be the body of the Vimana. Be made like a great flying bird of light metal. Isn't that curious, huh? You know, it's it's just out there. It's just out there. Is going from one island to another with these craft in three days and nights. And just an intelligent people constructed ships to cross oceans, jumping into space speedily with a craft using fire and water and containing 12 pillars, one wheel, three machines, 300 pivots, and 60 instruments. So, you know, these are people that don't have um, degrees in engineering, but still trying to get across what they saw and what they knew. And they even gave, you know, timelines on, on how long it took to, to fly from one side of the globe to another. You know, so I mean, these things, when they, when they come out and you start to understand them, you can really go down a ton of different rabbit holes. And I really suggest, if you can, go down as many rabbit holes as possible when you're going through an awakening because you really need to quench that understanding. You need to quench that thirst of knowledge and truth i mean i think we're at a point now in this day and age where really we we crave the truth and and there's nothing wrong with that because that's what's going to take us to new places oppenheimer who gave us nuclear weapons in this age made this quote if the radiance of a thousand suns were to burst at once into the sky that would be like the splendor of the mighty one now i am become death destroyer of the world now that's actually Again, it, it, it's a Vedic quote, and he was well aware of that. He was also told, wow, you've, you've set off the first nuclear weapon, the first atomic bomb. And he said, in this generation, in this age, because he knew that, you know, that technology was not new. It's a reflection on what has happened in past ages. The Brahmastra, nuclear weapon of ancient India. Well, really, it, it's it's again of these battles. When did the Kali Yuga start? Well, it, it technically starts when Krishna is no longer on earth and the last of the Devic influence on the planet is, is gone. And thus, we're basically left in the hands of the Asuras, so to speak. And, and again, that's what we have with the Kali Yuga starting. So, you know, all these depictions of flying cities, the wars of the gods in their, their vehicles, this battle has never stopped. And then we talk about the fact that, you know, humans, we get a lot of people thinking, well, humanity came from the Pleiades, but, you know, we didn't really come from the Pleiades. Pleiades were like a, a refugee stop, so to speak. So Lyra and the Lyran Wars um, are really the time period where humanity spread out in humanity's diaspora. Again, as above, so below in so many different ways. Uh, when these, are, these are the depictions. You know, you got the battle on the ground. It's just like we have today with armies. And then you got the Air Force up in the sky, flying, battling so clear to see now when we see movies like independence day and you know all the different extraterrestrial uh alien invasion ones it, it gets to be kind of obvious what's going on they wanted us to think we're all that there is they wanted us to to think that there's nobody else out there because again we're still under that influence we're still under the control of the real controllers that control the human controllers on the planet and are still interacting and influencing humanity. We see these diagrams of these flying saucers and we see that the CIA has files that claim Nazis had 2,500 mile an hour flying saucer 
And then we saw, you know, the Battle of L.A. We saw flying saucers over D.C. We saw Admiral Byrd go down to Antarctica with a whole military expedition only to come limping back after having lost uh, equipment and people and having their butts kicked. So, you know, the Nazis were in contact with these negative ETs, some of whom do look like what we might conceive of as Pleiadians, very, very Nordic looking as, oh, there's, wow. there's a little thunder in the background. Yeah. Perfect timing, perfect timing. And Cindy calls them the fallen Pleiadians. Mm -hmm. um, so you might take them as fallen angels, right? Angel just means messenger. Again, people often say things and they don't under even understand what the word means mm -hmm. or what its original meaning was. So these fallen Pleiadians were in contact with the Nazis. But then again, Hitler was fascinated with the occult, and so was uh, some of his top men. They were part of the Thule Society and actively engaged in trying to contact beings on the other densities. Unfortunately, one of the closest densities to us is the lower fourth, and that's where the, you know, EGG, well, the EGG are here physically. They have been here physically on the planet for thousands of years. Uh, there's only one originally Gigi still here, and you can't equate him to looking very much like the Dark Lord of the Sith. Um, it kind of like Soros, really, in the way. Yeah. Um, and again, Soros and the Pope, you know, these are some close relatives when you get down to it. But it is a tangled, tangled web that is all here. And this is fascinating right there. This is Enlil stabbing a sun goddess. That kind of says it all. And then you see Marduk in the battle with Tiamat. And Tiamat depicted as a dragon kind of would be reversed. Um, because when, when we look at, you know, the truth of the matter is, again, these beings like Enlil and Marduk, these are, we could call them Nibiruans. And it's fascinating to, to see because when we look to Nibiru, in some ways it's very much what we might envision hell. And, and then in our modern mythology, like Star Wars, it's pretty similar to where Darth Vader comes from. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the the sad part of it is, is when I look at it, it looks very sterile. The environment is not really alive, so it is something that's been created into into a type of a vessel that can be moved and manipulated through something of a, a black hole, you know, as far as how does it move? How does it get from point A to point, point B? And that's the best describing word that I can give you when I, when I was looking to see what it looked like and how it was able to move. So, um, yeah, a, a lot of these pictures that Mike's showing, it, it's, it's, it's very, very spot on, I'm afraid. It, it, it's really kind of disturbing. Yeah, absolutely. And then we have the Death Star, and there's a reality to that as well. When we when we see the Battle of um, Tiamat with Marduk, and Tiamat was really, you know, pretty m almost destroyed, destroyed as it was. Mm -hmm. And that is what we have uh, with the asteroid belt, because Tiamat was originally between Mars and Jupiter. And then it was reborn as Earth, basically through the direct intervention of many benevolent beings, including the creator of this universe. Through a super conscience. So uh, these beings having an understanding of what is happening and having a, a keen understanding of what thought can do and how they can co-create gathering together to help form that super consciousness, to bring back into form... Uh, a state of being that could save other beings and actually save and hold everything together in the cosmos. Absolutely. But here might be a better depiction of Marduk and Tiamat as we see Tiamat more of as a goddess. And then you could take the snake energy, the serpent energy as Kundalini as kundalini energy because again the kundalini energy when it is awakened in humans it activates the pineal gland and then we see them for who they are 
So again, there is so much truth layered with distortion as we see you know, in our modern mythos and in our ancient mythos. When we look to some of the biblical quotes, and let me get back here. Okay, so here we go with Sumerian god Enlil, bow by his side, symbolic for stars in the constellation of Orion. Ah, he stabs the sun god who has an all-seeing eye above her head. That's again, it's depiction. The all-seeing eye is your pineal gland for one. The sun awakens the pineal gland for another because the sun is a relay for source. The sun is a relay for not just the creator of this universe, but the source of all creation. And it's through the pineal gland, again, that we can truly see things for what they are. So this is basically celebrating the victory of, of the Kali Yuga, the victory of darkness over enlightenment. And also it, it's trying to kill the mother because it's through the mother, again, our father who art in heaven, no reference of the mother anywhere. When we look at um, the patriarchal societies that took over for the last several thousand years, when we look back farther, we find uh, that the goddess side of things, the divine mother was put in a higher place and then was basically trampled underfoot. We see that the corporations all around us are always polluting and destroying the mother. They're trying to pervert and destroy everything that is natural. We see that all around us. We see it in our schools. We see it everywhere. The politicians promote it because, again, who do these guys serve? These guys serve AI. Ultimately, it's an artificial intelligence, the real black dragon energy uh, that is just that. It's artificial. It's, it's not the natural of or order of things. So they want to put down everything that is natural. And here you see, um, again, Orion. When we see Orion, then I automatically start thinking of the, great, the three pyramids because they are lined up with the belt of Orion. Interesting to see here. Can you, this is from Job, the book of Job. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loosen the belt of Orion? I just thought that was curious too, pointing out those two places because they are so key in all this, so key. Pyramids Giza aligned perfectly with Orion's belt in the year 10,450 BC. Now that's so close to our Younger Dryas event again, that timeline when the Younger Dryas extinction happened and wiped out the vast majority of, of life on the planet. And originally, everything was in the plural. Again, with the Bible, when we go back to the oldest translations, the, the word that we take as Lord or God was originally in the oldest. The oldest sources of it show it's plural. It's Elohim. And Elohim is representing basically the assembly of the gods. Plural, 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 not singular course there is one source and there is one creator being that created this universe but then you have the Anunnaki and there's there's many of them and here we see a psalm of Asaph God presides in the divine assembly he renders judgment among the gods so God among the gods God among the gods that's a plurality that's not the source of all things so again, this is where the distortion is. There is one source, there is one creator of this universe, but it's not as is portrayed in the Bible. And we've talked about Deuteronomy 32.8, when the highest parted folks, when he separated the sons of Adam, he ordained the terms of the peoples by the number of the sons of Israel. Now again, there's many different in interpretations um, that change these really really key words but one thing to keep in mind again is separating and dividing the nations separating the sons of man he ordained the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God or the sons of the gods again when you go back and you and you realize that all this comes from the Sumerian legends that is talking all about the Anunnaki again and these beings that came down from above 
And again, everything was given to man from on high, from uh, you know people that came from the sky down here. It, it gets pretty clear. And then when we look to what we see with the 12 Olympian gods, and they're all, so often depicted on Mount Olympus, which is a flo floating mountain in the sky. Hello, hello, floating mountain in the sky. Didn't we start with floating cities in the sky, watching humanity? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. I mean, there's just so much information here that we really have to question. It's a very important time that we start to question because having us wake up is really important right now. Having us wake up to the tyranny that's involved of the whole, all of the different kinds of systems that keep us, keep us asleep and understanding that these systems are not out there for our, for our benefit. They're not out there for our development. They are out there for our control to keep us under control so waking up and understanding that there is different ways different means uh, to do things is really important right now because we're kind of in a mess if, if you look around I mean things are not going well absolutely so here you see an article talking about Enlil the original archetype of the chief deity of Rome equating them with Zeus and there was and is reference to the lesser gods in uh, the Vedic literature as well. So while you have beings like Vishnu and Brahma and Shiva on a certain level, you have Indra, which is a storm god, and also a god of lightning and thunder, very, very much again uh, equated and could be equated in some ways with Zeus. So you see there's these different levels because Indra would, would when times came and he was in trouble, he would go to Vishnu or Shiva or Brahma and ask for a boon. A boon is like a blessing and and look for help because there were situations that developed that he couldn't handle. Again, this lower echelon and this higher echelon from the more ancient times. So there's a lot of things in the Bible that might not make sense to you given, you know, the fundamentalist point of view, the the modern day point of view, but it's because it's it's all been glossed over. It's all been, uh, you know, as as always in everything that we have in this world, constant redaction, constant redaction. We see that in everything out there. So Psalm eighty two six, as I have said, you are gods. You are all the sons of the Most High, but like mortals you will die, and like rulers you will fail. Wait a minute, you are all gods? And it's written again, ye are gods. And Jesus, Yeshua, quoted, is it not written, ye are gods? Hello? There you go. You know, it, it's all right out there. So, you know, this is again the bigger picture. And yes, you know, the, the flood myth is there in, in the Enuma Elish and Atrahasis. We see all these different myths, all their origins, you know, coming out of uh, these different traditions that are far older than anything biblical. And yet, you know, we could even look to Genesis 1 and we see indications of the truth of things. That's what we need to do. We need to start picking out things that lead us to the truth and understand that we have it once once you understand, OK, we're being manipulated, then everything else generally falls into place. So in, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So, yes, there is a creator of all that we see. There is a creator of this entire universe. And when Cindy was channeling the being that her and I recognized as Vishnu, um, that's exactly how he described it. He, you know, it was just like talking about the waters of space as if space is water. Space is not a vacuum. It does exist, but it's not a vacuum. And it's it's loaded with the potential for everything. It's just about the act of creation. And again, God said, sound. Sound creates. Let there be light. It takes intention, but sound can, creates. It. There's that power of manifesting in sound. That is why we do the mantras, because, you know, there is um, 
there are different traditions that recognize mantra yoga as a form of union with the divine. And it can actually help build the light body. It can actually build our Merkaba and, and take us, enable us to go to much, much higher realms. Because again, we, we can go places just with our light body that we'll never be able to build a ship to go to. And that is again why the ships in different ages, different yugas are made of different substances. So let there be light and there was light and God saw light was good, separated the light from the darkness, light day, darkness, night. Now what's interesting too is when you look to, he, he creates the veg, vegetation and he produced the vegetation plants bearing seeds according to their kind, trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kind. When, when the humans, um, God created mankind in his own image, etc., and tells them be fruitful in num number, etc. I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be your food. Right? They will be your food. And every green plant for food, you know, again, for all the birds and everything, again, the medicines. It's fascinating too. It's after the fall that you have blood sacrifices. And again, the fall is what? The fall is the yugas. The f not, not necessarily the Death Star, but it is the coming of the Death Star. Absolutely. The fall is the yugas. Because over here, we're in the golden age. This is the beginning of the fall, even though we're in the golden age. And then we're in that fallen state in the Kali Yuga and start our way back up again. So that's the biblical fall. And again, you know, all these stories, there's a basics in reality. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it, I just find it really, really fascinating to learn all of these different things and go through everything. But always with the understanding that the controllers, they're the ones who are allowing this information out. So I, I, I definitely use my discernment when I read through these and I... A lot of things, I just get a lot of different kind of visions. I get different, different things come come through me when I look at different beings than other than what's been written. So make sure you leave your mind open. You leave that space open so that you can find your truth because that's the most important thing. Your truth is extremely important. Absolutely. And here you see feather-robed and turbaned archer, the figure of Asher. You know, Asher is um, a deity. And not to keep going off on tangents, but here you see Asher, a god, right? And when God is at the burning bush and appears to be almost like a jinn, you know, because it's a fire that can't be consumed. And Moses says, who shall I say, who shall I say sent you? He said, Ea, Asher, Ea. Isn't that interesting? I am that I am is how it's translated and you can't take it in one sense or you could say I am Asher oh mm. oh okay yeah interesting and and who is Asher identified with Enlil so isn't that just curious very interesting as always guys thanks for your support on Ko-Fi and Patreon much love may be blessed by the true creator of this universe. Namaste. Namaste.